Parenting is hard. Few of us feel up to the task. The world is shifting, quickly and dramatically. All of us feel the changes affecting our families. The stress and pressure can be intense. We are here to help sort the good and the bad, provide insight and bring hope. Welcome to Brilliantly Brave Parenting. We're so glad you stopped by. Hi, and welcome to season five of Brilliantly Brave Parenting. I am your co-host and partner in crime, Pastor Brad Mathias. And I'm Robert Beeson. It's good to be with you today. It is good to be here. It is. Feeling look, spunky today. Yeah, you, you got a little rosy tint to your cheeks. Cold, cold air kills germs. So one of the things that we've been doing recently is uh, kind of getting to know uh, you getting to know us, and so we've come up with a series of questions. I don't know where you got these, Brad, but they're some of them are kind of stupid. Um, in keeping with well, then I'm not going to admit I might have wrote them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to ask you to 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 pick a number, and I'm going to read the question. You're going to have to answer it completely honestly, or um, there will be shock treatment. So, uh, pick a number between one and twenty-five. Twenty-four. Uh, See, so yeah, I threw you. You're expecting a middle pack number. Do you collect anything? I do, what actually. Do you collect? Uh, they're really odd. My wife's an antiquer. Mm -hmm. And so like 15 years into our 30 years of marriage, I figured out I better start collecting something or I'm going to be the most unhappy, bored husband in tow in every antique mall she drives me to. Right. Oh, so you find something in the antique. Yeah. So Cause okay. I got to have something to do in okay. there. Right. I mean, there's some creepy stuff in there. That's a really uh, idea. But I found these little swords that they used to make at the turn of the century, like like replicas of famous swords. Okay. And they're only like four inches long and they used them as like hors d'oeuvre things. But they're they're like real <laughs> metal. Like they're really? they're not like a throwaway thing. They're like a real okay. expensive thing. And so they're like 25 bucks when you find one. And I collect them. I've got a bunch now. Where do you, how, do you display them? In my den. Yeah. Really? You have them like laid out, all these little swords? Yeah, I have them on these little stands. I have these little shelves. Mm -hmm. And uh, my kids know, everybody knows. So, you know, when they find them, they get me one. And they're they're kind of manly. They're cool. Well, I don't know if they're manly, Brad. But it is it is cool. I actually like that idea. I, I don't think I would stoop to collect Well, and I swords, put them with but... all my Bibles. So, you know, as a priest, uh, I have I all these, these I see. You're you know, reference the segue. books and stuff it. like that. Yeah. Okay. And so the sword is symbolic of what? The Word of God. <laughs> so I think it's kind of a manly and pastoral hobby. If it was a if it was a regular sword, I would agree with you. But a little tiny, I have toy one sword. of those big regular I've swords too. It. It's a big, you know, Scottish know. cleaving cleaving thing, man. I know. It's like five feet long. It's so awkward going to restaurants with you when you have that. It's I know, really. But at least I don't wear my kilt when I wear it. <clears throat> okay, that's true. Well, I think that's a great idea. Actually, I'm going to start doing because my wife likes antiquing too, and I hate antiquing. I so know, right? You got to find something. I'm going to find something. Maybe a little. Apple Sports memorabilia, something. Like something. Yeah. Uh, there's some creepy dolls in an antique thing. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, there's some stuff in there. I, I just don't go down those aisles. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's exciting to go through life and uh, discover new people that you have a sort of a natural affinity for, right? And it's, yeah. you know, then because there are some people in your life, like Robert, that just grate on you forever. <laughs> and you, even if you've known them a decade, they just don't seem to get any smoother on the edges. Just, I'm just here for just, the money. Just as sharp as they were yeah, when you well, first met them. But today's guest is not like that at all, Robert. I'm so He is a very that. fine man. He's a priest. He's an Anglican priest. And uh, he has written a book. His name is Bob Fabie. He also has his own podcast, uh, Third Space Podcast. And uh, he's written a book, Not My Jesus. So he's our guest today. Welcome to Brilliantly Brave Parenting. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Glad so, to have you here. Sorry you had to endure that little banter <laughs> with us. but um, It's okay. I forgot my tiny swords. I'll have to make it. Be honest. Be honest. Isn't that a little weird? A tiny sword? You know, yeah. It sounds kind of G.I. Joe-ish. <laughs> like, yeah. It okay. is a little G.I. Joe-ish. I'm not afraid of that. I had I a G.I. Joe. Kung Fu <laughs> I was, grip. I had Kung Fu grip. Yeah. yeah that's the one, right? Yeah. yeah. So if somebody came in, if I was at somebody's house and they're like, hey, good to have you here. Come into my office. And let me show you my tiny swords. I'd be a little <laughs> creeped out. That's just well, a little I don't weird. do that. That would be weird. But if they come well, into my office. In the cheese squares as you handle <laughs> Yeah, them. exactly. And who doesn't love a good cheese square? 
<laughs> True. Okay. All right. Let's get back to our guest today, Bob. Sorry for our dysfunction. Robert oh, hasn't fantastic. taken his meds. Uh, here's the thing: we're we're dads, right? And we're in the middle yep. of uh, a culture where dads are not necessarily celebrated. Uh, they're sort of teased and made fun of and, and demeaned a lot, especially on television and media. Yeah. Um, and I love it when I get to talk to a dad who's also in ministry, who's written a book and has a podcast and has a passion about this. So we're and is Anglican. Well, I wasn't going to be biased. But well, no, I love that too. I, I don't currently attend an Anglican church, but I consider myself an Anglican. Um, so I. We're in good company here. Backslidden. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I think what what I love about this is that he's an evangelical who also walked into the Anglican faith like me. And me. So we're like the accidental Anglicans, you know, just like. I like that. Accidental well, it's Todd Anglican. Hunter wrote a book oh, called okay. Accidental Anglican. He's a vineyard guy who became an Anglican priest on the West Coast. Anyway, we have really gone down the rabbit trail. Bob, welcome to Brilliantly Brave. So glad to have you here. Tell us about your book, man. Well, I want to say, first of all, uh, it's great to be here. I'm grateful uh, for you guys having me. And I do feel a kinship, uh, regardless of whether or not um, Robert worships in the proper church. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the reason I, <laughs> the reason I, I hope my, that was yeah. okay. <laughs> no, so, the, so the book is written to, to try to help Christians uh, not lose focus about what they are uh, keen about. And uh, like we just went through an election cycle, for instance, and so the book title is germane. It says "Not My Jesus," and it's it's a way of saying, look, uh, people want to co-opt Jesus into all of their arguments about um, you know anything on social media, who they vote for, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole point of the book is to to try to get Christians back on track in terms of doing what it is that I think that God would have them actually really concerned about. What motivated you on your on your in your personal life to 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 go? I got to jump into this because I, I agree with you that it's it's important to to kind of reorient. But what, personally, what what got you to the place where like I got to write a book about this? Yeah, I, you know, it was um, as a pastor. Obviously, you know, I'm in the lives of people around me, and and uh, and just kind of watching the the fear and the the anger and the distraction that people have in in conversations, uh, obviously on social media, but, but also, you know, just sitting across from them, you know, over a cup of coffee and hearing what, what are the things that are taking up their time or their thoughts or their energy. And I keep, keep thinking, you, you know, this isn't what Christ would have for us. Mm. Um, and then I saw, uh, Talladega nights and I knew right away, <laughs> 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 you don't even have to finish that. Eight pounds, six ounce baby Jesus that I had for <laughs> Dear baby Jesus. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we just almost, I almost fell off the ledge there. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that I love, and, and as a pastor as well, it's it's a temptation. I live in the Middle Tennessee Bible Belt, where if you're not a Republican, you're not really a Christian or American. Uh, mm. And I'm not a Republican. I'm a Christian. And right. so I love the idea that you're sort of going after this this issue where people are trying to manipulate God, it sounds, into their own image. And right. uh, that was sort of what got him killed, right? That was the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Neither one of them right. could churn them, and so they had to get rid of them. Right. Yeah, and as, as a matter of fact, I mean, I, I see great parallels between who we are today and how people behaved in the first century. So I don't really blame you, you know, I'm not a Pharisee hater. I'm not a set. You know what I mean? It, it the, mm -hmm. the way that I think about it is Jesus uh, was walking along doing ministry and, and preparing to take on hell, sin and death. And people came up to him and said, here's this coin. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And, and, and Jesus was kind of like, well, you know, whose image is on the coin? Well then give it to them. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't get it twisted. Or, or when he was tried, you know, they tried to drag him into the Hillel Shammai debate about marriage and those kinds of things. And Jesus was like, look, this stuff happened because you guys were hard hearted. Like, don't, don't get it twisted. There, there's something that I'm here for. And there's a job that I'm trying to do. And as a matter of fact, uh, if you say you are with me and in me and I am in you, then you have a job to do as well. Hmm. And it doesn't look like, uh, getting angry and freaking out and acting as if the sky is falling when your candidate does or doesn't win. Uh, well said. I, yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that uh, can challenge parents 
is this idea of uh, reflecting love to people you don't necessarily agree with. And yeah. your kids are watching that, you know, mm-hmm. it's sort of the Archie Bunker thing for the older <laughs> among us, you know, that uh, you have influence just by the yeah. way you respond to a television ad or a, or, or a content on TV. Have you, I mean, it says in your bio that you've raised a couple of, of uh, teenagers that are that right. are in high school. I imagine this has come up at home a few times. Uh, just a few times. <laughs> so, so uh, the thing I, I paraphrase uh, Jesus and I just say, look, love is for people that we don't like and that we don't agree with. Hmm. That is the thing that's supposed to govern all of my relationships. So, so say that how again. Do I, I want to make sure we get that love is for people that we don't like and that we don't agree with. <laughs> That's really good. Well, I, you know, because I, Jesus was really clear about that, right? Where he said, he's like, Hey, look, even the Pharisees love those who love yeah, right. them. That's not a big deal. And we, we do make much of that. I mean, I think we, we want to love people who love us. That's easy, but that love would be what governs those that I don't agree with is really important. And I think so as a parent, um, you know, 18 and 16, uh, at this point, uh, from my kids ages, um, I, I think one of the things as parents, we, we may not, <laughs> we may not admit to this publicly, which I'm doing right now on a podcast, <laughs> but that it's easy for us to look at our kids like objects. Hmm. And it's easy for us to just go into management mode around our children. Hmm. And instead of viewing them as, as somebody who is caught up in the story of Christ and who's, who's God is writing their story as we are with them. And we have the privilege of being in, in this particular season of the of that book with with our children um that it's easy for us to say you know they, they didn't do what i asked them to do you know <laughs> doggone it you know or they're not they're not getting the grades that i blah 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 you know and and and, and we just wind up thinking of them as as projects you know or, or 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 something else so i think this idea that other people are objects is a, is a really important piece to how we one, how we think about ourselves. Does God view us that way? Absolutely not. And then two, do we view our children that way? Absolutely not. And then three, how can we view other people as, as objects of love versus objects of scorn or, or, or those kinds of things? So it comes up a lot, uh, you know, whether it be a boy or uh, a teacher or, or a coworker or something like that. Uh, with my kids and they ask questions about, man, you know, well, this is how this made me feel. And, and so, yeah, trying to teach them how to, how to differentiate between who the person is and their behavior is, is challenging as I try to do it myself. So I want to, I want to park there for just a second, if we can, and unpack that a little bit, because I think it's so important, this idea of treating our kids and other people, but we're talking about kind of parenting here. So Mm -hmm. in this instance, the treating our kids like their projects. I find myself, <clears throat> you know, trying to modify behavior so much and like disappointed on certain things. And how do you practically, if you're, if you're seeing an issue, kind of walk us through some practical application to what that might look like personally, if you don't mind, um, sure. with your son that may bring home some grades that you're just, you've talked about this a million times and it's still, <laughs> you know, he assures you everything's good. And then you get the report or you go online and you're like, you know what, there's all kinds of stuff. And it's, hard to not jump in and just want to correct. And uh, yeah, so yeah, for sure. So, um, okay. Uh, basic principle for me is that when somebody's repeating themselves, I don't believe that they think that I've heard them. So if I hear somebody saying something over and over and over again, then I go, okay, um, how can I speak to them so that they understand that I've heard what they were saying? Mm. Uh, So, or if somebody raises their voice, I automatically assume that they they don't feel heard because they're raising their voice, and so I have to hmm. I have to figure out a way to hear what it is they're saying. And the same goes for my children. Just because I've said something a thousand times doesn't mean they're hearing me. And so um, I can't make them share my concern for their grades, for instance. And especially increasing in our culture, um, you, you know, delayed gratification is almost non-existent. Right. Uh, and so I, I can't ingrain in my children something that I don't practice myself. And I can't practice it and then say, see, look at what I do. You <laughs> should be like me. <laughs> right. 
you know? But what I can do is, is take what I think is a really godly approach and talk about how cherished they are outside of their behavior. Um, I'm not happy with your grades, but I love you deeply. Mm. Um, I know that you're smarter than this um, because of how God puts you together. Um, but I think you're incredible. And, and not in the, you know, everybody gets a trophy kind of way, but in, in the, um, I'm going to talk to you about how I think God would talk to you. And I don't see God sitting there talking to my kid saying, now, how come you didn't get better grades? Hmm. Um, I would see God saying, man, I think you are fantastic. I'm so excited about who you are becoming. And when we don't talk to our kids that way, I think we're really missing the boat because then, you know, it becomes kind of moralism and, and, and we devolve into something other than our children's champions. We, you know, we become something different. Now, I think there are really clear expectations and, and really clear communication. We, we have a saying in our marriage that uh, expectation without communication leads to frustration. And so we say, I have an expectation of you and your behavior. Are we clear on this? You know, what do you think of this? Good. And then um, I will try to negotiate with my kids about what what might happen if those expectations aren't met instead of me just make, making them. Um, and, and please understand, this is when I'm good. <laughs> I get it. No, I, I totally get it. <laughs> when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm hitting it out of the park, I'm doing pretty good. And I'm not in the heat of the moment and, uh, and feeling really frustrated by, uh, by their behavior. No, but it's a target. What you're talking about is exactly, like, exactly. Yeah, I love that. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. It's bringing your A game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm a little convicted. Uh, my kids are grown and are having kids now. Uh, but you know, in the process, you could actually apply these principles to being a pastor too. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, because it, you know, any relationship that we're engaged with. So there's this sort of need for us to resist our culture, which is trying to pull us apart uh, and really focus on that message or ideal of reconciliation, which is what, what we're talking about is right. how, do, how do you disagree with someone, uh, respect them and also stay reconciled in the, in the relationship. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, so it's, it's interesting. So I, you know, I wrote this book and there's a, there's a whole piece in this book about othering. Um, and I, and I really feel like that idea of making somebody else an object, uh, really is germane basically across the board in every relationship that I have. So I don't care if it's, if it's my, my children or my wife, or it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I, I think that objectification in kind of all of its forms is, is part of the problem. So when I remove somebody, when I remove somebody from the story that God is writing in their lives and, and I just assume that, that that's not happening or I act like it's not happening, then I, then I really think I'm violating what it is that Christ wants to do in and through them. Uh, and I can't, I, I, um, I can't think that that's a good thing for me to be doing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it, it's sort of coached, you know, I'm, I, I'll, I listen to uh, satellite radio a lot because I, I drive all over the place. And one of the things that, you know, I flip between CNN and Fox News mm -hmm. and you get radically different takes on the same events. Mm. Right. And the objectification idea is really helpful to sort of unmask what's really going on. Yeah. Because both part, you know, both the conservative and the liberal views of our, our current events they're they're using us as pawns, objects to sort of get to their uh, desired outcome. Yeah, exactly. Well, and 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 so you know whether you think the monster is capitalism, whether you think the monster is power, whether you, whatever the monster you think is behind all of those things. You know, I look at I look at Ephesians and say we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Uh, but against rulers and principalities and powers. And so, so I can't make a person the object of my disdain. I, I can disagree with their behavior, but, but I can't, I can't make a person that thing. Hmm. And so, so when I think about, when I think about when I, I, I you know, politics, pastoring, it, it doesn't matter for me. Um, 
what I, what I can do is try to make really wise judgments about like, well, that's not behavior that I value. Uh, and so I don't want to condone that behavior versus that person is a, you know, blank, right, fill in right. the blank, you know, whatever. Oh, you're a liberal. Well, that, that means X, Y, and Z. And for me, the kind of the part of the book that, that I think is, you, you know, kind of the pivot is, is that Jesus was really clear. He, he was, he was really clear about calling people, um, on the carpet about their behavior and, and even judging them like crazy. And it's okay for him to do that because that's who he is. He's the Messiah. <laughs> so he has all the right to do all of those things, but we don't either. We, we allow him to do that. And then we, so, so Christians, I think get it twisted where Jesus says, I'm the judge you love. Right. Mm-hmm. And what we want to say is I want to judge you do the loving. <laughs> and it's wrong. It's just, it's just altogether wrong. And so I think the more that we can say, uh, amen to Jesus saying, love me with all you got. And I think by extension, learn how to be loved with all you got, then love your neighbor and love your enemy. Hmm. I think if Christians were, were actually really wrestling with that in creative ways and, and having great conversations about what that might look like instead of, you know, the, I don't know, their third study on Ecclesiastes for, I don't know, you know, 17 <laughs> years, or whatever. But it, it, it would look different, I think. Mm-hmm. And we would change the dynamic between how we engage the culture and, and how the culture engages the church. And I love that. You know, the, the via media, uh, this idea of a middle way is, uh, is, is steeped in, in the, the traditions of the church that go back hundreds of years, this idea that Christians are to be a bridge between our culture and Christ um, is kind of a cool idea. Um, and I, as I'm listening to you talk about that and, and you know, thinking about how this would fit in a parent's mindset, you know, we are, as parents, we're, we're often caught trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit or God um, in trying to convince our kids what's right or wrong. And mm-hmm. we really can't. Like, we don't really have that power to transform a heart. All we have <coughs> is the ability to model it, right? Like, right. And when they're young, you enforce the rules to keep them safe. But at a certain point, as especially in the teen years, you, you really become the illustration of the point. Right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. And I think it's hard, you know, at least it has been in my life. And, you know, I have a teenager and then two adult kids now, um, biological and, um, kind of detaching. I think you said it, you nailed it when you talk, we, we objectify everything. Like we play the role of Holy spirit champion God yeah, to our kids. Exactly. And like, we forget the fact that in context that it's, they're just, a, they're another life, an extension of God, not an extension of us. And I mean, I know that, yes, they are an extension of our family and there should be roots and blah, 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 blah. But like from a mindset standpoint, realizing that God is is writing their story, which is different than our story. We play a role in it, but we are not the, we are not the primary. Like, we're not the uh, author. We're not the author. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, yeah. and I think we as parents sometimes get mixed up exactly doing that, thinking that we are the author and finisher of our kids' lives. And it's, it's hard to step back and, and start relinquishing a little bit of the, you know, the control with our kids, but you're meddling now, man. <laughs> it's yeah, so well, true. I mean, it's, I, I mean, we uh, we have expectations. He had a quote earlier. I'm gonna. I'm, I think I wrote it down right. Expectation without communication leads to frustration. And uh, I, I've, I, I know he said that in, rela- in the context of relationships, but man, I'm thinking I have that vertically. Hmm. Like I, I have frustration with God when He doesn't do what I want. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I have expectations without communication. Hmm. You know, it's just a one way thing where I'm just telling him what needs to be done. Yeah. And, uh, how does and, that work for you? And not so good. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's another podcast, but the two by four of love comes out and Brad gets educated. Uh, but at the end of the day, parenting is this sort of, uh, pendulum swing, I think, for a lot of people where you really sort of get this for a little bit and you apply it and then it sort of fades and then you're scrambling again. Um, I don't know. I just, 
there's such encouragement to hear you lay out these principles uh, so well, Bob, because what what you're challenging us with is to really move away from our culture's way of looking at relationships and re-immerse ourselves in the way Jesus looked at relationships. And f- for our audience, that's most important with the way we interact with our kids. That's right. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah, I think I, I think what 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 would it look like if um, if our kids had that had, knew without a shadow of a doubt that we were their biggest champion, and and that and that we we actually were were cheering them on, not from the you know weird soccer parent standing on the sideline, Johnny better you know whatever, but but more like deep deep communication around how much they're loved. And cherished, mm-hmm. and that that I I think one of the things we can practice as parents is to say to our kids, look, there is nothing you will ever do to keep me from loving you ever, and so so grades, relationships, all it doesn't matter, right? I'm not going to parent out of fear. I'm going to parent from a place of deep deep love because I think I think our responsibility is to actually model the love that God has for us to our children, and. It's easy for us not to do that. Yeah. And that, 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 that would be the goal. Yeah. And it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of foresight to see that if, if we're raising kids that really truly get this, they're going to have a much easier time believing their heavenly father is That's like right. that. That's right. Um, because so many people struggle today believing that their heavenly father could love them. Mm. Yeah. Um, myself included. I, I mean, I think that is one of the greatest challenges to our faith, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Everyone believes God loves the world, but they don't really believe they love us. You know, yeah. like we yeah. can believe him for all those other people, but he, if they really knew how I was. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so parents probably struggle as much or more than anyone in receiving God's love. Um, yeah. But it's it's important because you can't really communicate it. You can't really model it yeah. if you haven't really accepted it for yourself. Right. Very Can't cool. give away what you don't have. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Yeah. I, I I love I love the premise of your book, and it's been so good spending a little time unpacking that. Um, how would our listeners get in touch with you or find out more about your book? So um, I'm I'm grateful that you love it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, you can uh, you can find it on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, I have a website, uh, BobFaby.com. Uh, I sound like a dot com guy. <laughs> apologize. Uh, I'm on, uh, I'm on, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram and Twitter. You can, you can track it, track me down on all of those, um, avenues. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time out. We know you're on uh, Western time. So this is an early call for you and a sacrifice. So thank you for being so faithful. Uh, thank you for serving the kingdom of God so well. And, uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. Yeah, it'll be fun. Awesome. Right. Thank Thanks. you so much. What our kids believe is going to define them for a lifetime. According to George Barna, by the age of 13, what a kid believes is what he'll die believing. For parents and for pastors, that's a frightening experience, especially if you've got an 11 or 12 year old. At the iShine Ministries headquarters, this became a huge priority in the last year. We partnered with the Tween Gospel Alliance to bring you a brand new resource known as the Shock and Awe Study Guide. And I'm here with one of the co-founders of this entire program, Robert Beeson. Can you tell us what is the Shock and Awe Study Guide? It is awesome. More than that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The Shock and Awe Study Guide is a super cool thing that either a parent can do with their kid or a youth pastor can do with their students or a children's pastor can do with their students. And here's the cool thing about it. It is apologetics for kids. Wow. So it's the really huge evidence and thoughts of apologetics wrapped in a way that is really tangible and simple for kids to understand, answering four primary questions. And they are, what if there's a God? What if the Bible is true? What if Jesus is who he said he was? And what if I'm part of that plan? And we believe if you can answer 
answer those four questions and you are drawn through evidence proving those four questions that really it's going to it's going to establish a pretty unshakable foundation of faith that sounds very helpful especially if you're a parent or pastor and you're concerned about the condition of your child's faith what they believe what the voices of culture are telling them if that's you and you're interested go to ishinelive.com and check out in our web store the shock and awe study guide it has a digital cloud video base so it's four studies in a small paperback volume for nine dollars and it has four videos that go with four studies it can be done in a weekend it can be done over a month or it can be done bi-monthly however you need it it is a fantastic resource that i have used as a pastor in my own home church and i have been impressed so check it out check it out well robert uh that was a fun sort of like meeting another brother yeah it is i didn't know i had another brother (laughs) yeah i didn't know it (laughs) Yeah, I just, there's so many uh, interesting parallels and interconnections there with people that we both knew and yet we'd never met. Yeah. So that was kind of cool for me. He's um, g- great insight, super simple, um, but complicated to to put into action, you know, like um, the subjectifying of people and um, our relationship with God. I think it's, it, it made me think, I mean, it's, you know, I've, I've been reflecting about this kind of thing, you know, viewing my kids as projects rather than people. And, um, I think he really, he helped clarify a couple of things and, and, and gave some real practical tips on, on ways that we can engage our kids. I, I, that was a really good conversation. Yeah. I, you know, it's one of those things where you can tell he's a deep thinker. I mean, he's fun and he's kind of congenial, but at the end of the day, he's thinking about these things. Yeah, absolutely. To write a book like that and authentic. I mean, you can tell he values authenticity with relationships and with his, you know, spirituality and, and everything. So that I'm, I can't. I haven't read the book yet. I can't wait to read it. Well, <clears throat> you know, he said something that got my attention. If someone is re- repeating themselves or yes. raising their voice. We can assume they don't feel heard. Right. Exactly. That nails it. Like, that's what I'm saying. Super I mean, it, simple, of just, course. But it, it, when he said that, I was like, "Oh my gosh! I've I've lived 49 years. I've never picked that up." Yeah. You know oh, how helpful that is to really recognize yeah. how a person is reacting if they're raising their voice or they're repeating yeah. themselves. You can count on the fact that they're not being heard. So. I mean, I can remember times when I, when my kids uh, would get so frustrated with me, they would they would yell at me, mm-hmm. and and I would think, man, what a defiant, ungrateful smile, <laughs> exactly, you know. And uh, <coughs> I missed that, mm-hmm. you know. I'm I'm I missed what was happening in that moment. Yeah, man, no, that's very very so very good. I guess my hope would be that if you're listening to this and and you're if it's an if this to- topic or these issues are in any way front and center for you, that you maybe write a couple of these things down for yourself, yeah, and uh, put them on your you know on your fridge or in your bathroom medicine cabinet and tape them up there and and keep them in front of you and try some of this stuff out, see if it helps. Yeah, love it. I think it was such good insight and uh, kind of nailed me between the eyes. So I'm going to remember this. Me too. Well, uh, we're excited that you stopped by, and uh, we want you to feel as welcome as possible. Uh, we are the Brilliantly Brave Parenting Podcast, and we're a part of the Tween Gospel Alliance. And you can find out all about us on the BrilliantlyBraveParenting.com website. Uh, we have links to all of our guests' uh, information and ministries, uh, books, videos, whatever uh, each guest is related to. And you can you can definitely find out quickly more about each topic of our different podcasts. We also rely on the generous support of listeners. We're a nonprofit. So we uh, we are grateful for anything that you could stop by and share with us one time or as a regular giver. So enough about the money. We're just glad you're here. We are glad you're here. And we will see you again here next week. God bless you. Be encouraged, parents. You are not alone. In Paul's letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, he writes, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Brilliantly Brave Parenting wants to be an encouragement and support that parents can rely on. Would you consider liking us and sharing us with a friend? As a part of the Tween Gospel Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization dependent on the support of friends like you. 
Thanks for stopping by. We'll be right here next week. Well, we're very excited to announce a partnership with the guys that we know from Boise, Idaho, Robert. Yes, we are. New release today. They're fantastic. Very, very relevant for what's going on. If you want to discover new music in the Christian realm, that's kind of the only place to go. Yeah, and not only do they have amazing music and amazing reviews and just a lot of information about Christian artists, but they are creating with us a brand new devotional product. Call it IRL Resources. Do you know what that stands for, Brad? I found out. You did? What does it stand for? It stands for In Real Life. That's exactly right, Brad. Very good. In Real Life, because a lot of times we have these standard devotionals that you know that, that we see, and, and we thought that it would be kind of cool to use their expertise in Christian music, couple that with actual scriptural and devotional thought that digs you deeper, not only into the song, but incorporates it into real life. And so it's a very vibrant and very awesome resource for families and for pastors. Yeah, and so if you uh, have a preteen or a teen in your home and you're looking for a new devotional to do weekly, we have a digital subscription online at IRLresources.com. It's very inexpensive. The first study is free to check it out. There's nothing to lose. You should go there and see what's the latest thing in Christian devotional. Absolutely. You won't regret it.